no surprise. The fifth episode of the Blu-ray Collection unboxing from the Criterion Collection. But I only have four this time, uh, instead of like a bunch, like the past two um, or three episodes. So this is only going to be a little bit shorter, but uh, specifically the past two. And also, um, um, somewhere in, I think, in two weeks or somewhere in the middle of this month, you're going to get a channel update. Um, this is going to, of course, regarding Macy's Parade Balloons and some of the other things. Um, expect that somewhere either two weeks or next week. Uh, uh, it's either going to be next week or the following week, but um, you'll find out a little bit. So, with that being said, time for another round. And we are going to start this up with... Uh, yeah, this is the only fully movie that I don't have in the English language for this episode specifically. And this is coming from a well-known director you may know called Guillermo del Toro. And I am, of course, talking about Spide number 838 from 2006, Pants Labyrinth. Um, many people have, of course, did consider this, if not maybe del Toro's best one, even though The Shape of Water, which I really did enjoy it, and it totally deserved the best picture winner um this of course was a big hit um at the time for mexico um like especially at, at the oscars like um it oh i'm really surprised by the r rating about this when i was um looking this up but um in terms of the awards contention it was it was it won for art direction makeup and cinematography and it was nominated for original score, original screenplay for Guillermo del Toro, but did not win the best international slash foreign language film category back then, and when it was still called that, because it lost to a film called The Lives of Others, which is from Germany. And later on, the director of that film would direct Never Look Away. So, yeah, because if you know what film uh, beat Pat's Labyrinth is The Lives of Others, and I know... Like, a lot of the times, the most critically acclaimed one usually would get screwed over um, during the time. Like, Amelie losing to, um, I believe it was, uh, No Man's, yeah, No Man's Land. And Pat's Labyrinth kind of follows it up with where it's the most critically acclaimed film. And it got the most nominations, even a screenplay one, but lost to another film. And, um, this is an amazing film. Um... Uh, looks like I think my booklet kind of a little bit is a little bit crunched up a little bit um, but um, of course uh, it's obviously of course this um, girl that is uh, with her mother um, that is pregnant are moving into um, supposedly their new uh, the her new father's area during um, I believe it was like like it's a fictional like is it what war was it again like, um, like somewhere during World War II, because it's set in 1944, um, but specifically some point of Spanish thing, but, um, since this movie is from Mexico, um, and basically, um, she has been kind of been considered, like, um, a princess through a mysterious, um, a, a mysterious, um, creature played by Doug, Doug Jones, um, who would also play the creature in The Shape of Water, and um, tells her that she could be the princess if she follows these specific um, areas to get her back to where she is. And it is just a beautiful film. Like, definitely, like, next in the shape of water. And it's very interesting. I'm going a little bit of spoiler territory that I found a little bit comparisons to this in the shape of water. Even though this was released first before the shape of water um, 11 years later. But... One thing it is about with both of these films that really, like, I was not expecting, having the main character be killed by the antagonist. I mean, like, that, like, I was like, no! Like, that was sad. Like, and I completely forgot, like, because in the opening scene you see her, uh, her blood coming, like, out of her nose going back in since this is an R-rated film. And then when I was watching the edit, it's like I completely forgot about that opening scene. And oh my gosh! But 
Yeah, and it's very interesting because you have an antagonist that involved with, like, some sort of a war thing because uh, The Shape of Water was taking place during the Cold War. Um, and you do have a creature playing Doug Jones, but the only thing is uh, he doesn't see the creature. Um, but you really do feel for the main character, who is, I believe, e um, I don't know how to pronounce her, but um, Ivana Bicurio. I believe that's how it's pronounced. And also, um, uh, Mabro Verdua, who is an Itamama Tabian, the main, um, woman in that film, is also in this film as the, the maid to the captain, um, of this one. So, yeah, Doug Jones is the only recognizable American actor, but I, I didn't even realize that was him until, I think, like, when I was looking at the cast list, and it was like, Wow, so he played two different creatures in two different Del Toro movies. One speaking in Mexican, um, in Spanish, I meant, and one, um, obviously with just sounds, but I don't know if they came from him or not, but. Well being said, um, definitely a great one. I don't think The Shape of Water will probably be in the collection, even though some Del Toro films have been in it, but, like, don't expect, like, that to be in the collection, but, like, probably his smaller work and I just love the cover of it, but yeah. Question if I do think I think it should have won the Oscar, I can't say because I haven't watched the lives of others, but uh, Del Toro, what can I also say? All right, so the next one actually comes from director Robert Altman. A lot of Robert Altman films are in the Criterion Collection, and I have been going through, as you guys can tell, I've been going through more of the Oscar-nominated movies. Um, like, I had kind of finished the 2010s, I finished the 2000s, um, because there are two other 2000 movies that are also going to be in this later. And I have watched all the 90s Oscar movies that are in the Criterion Collection, except for one. And um, that's kind of an exception that I had, not because of personal reasons, but it's... I didn't have time for it, but the thing is, um, there are, of course, two Robert Altman films that were nominated in the Oscars in the 90s, and the one I have is from 1992, which is spy number 812, The Player. That does not sound good. Um, this is, uh, Tim Roth, it's based on the 1988 novel of the same name by Michael Tolkien, who did wrote the script, and it's about this, uh, fictional director, um, who's kind of a, I don't know how to pronounce, like, do it, but, uh, if I can remember the plot, uh, like, he's basically, uh, has, is going a little bit of a tight situation, because, um, he had to deal with a screenwriter that he completely forgot about, um, and after years later, um, he kind of accidentally, um, killed him, and this is actually the very beginning of the movie, I believe, yeah, this, yeah, um, I don't know, like, many issues, like, in the shipping. Like, first the pamphlet, the Pants Labyrinth was a little bit torn. Now this, the Blu-ray disc of the player is uh, kind of loose. But, um, he's been, like, kind of hiding in this. And, like, there are many other people that's been going on. And, um, he kind of gets in a relationship with, um, the screenwriter's widow. Um, uh, and it's kind of a little bit of secret because you have, uh, Tim Robbins, of course, and, like, the police are kind of investigating, Whoopi Goldberg's in this movie. Um, like, uh, and it's kind of a little bit uh, difficult, but the thing is, I, I had watched the movie in a little bit. Well, I have seen it. It I have watched, but I ha don't remember it um, right now, just because I'm obviously in front of the camera. Um, but I really did enjoy this movie. Uh, yeah, I actually kind of was surprised. Um, of course, I mentioned Whoopi Goldberg in this one. Um... Richard E. Grant is also in this one, and although he plays a small part, he is so great in it. Um, I like uh, his performance a lot. And then, like, you got um, Thomas Newman did the score, and there's, like, several cameos from real-life celebrities that are in there. So, like, I know there was Harry Belafonte, uh, there was Andy McDowell, um, like, like, there were so many others, like, like, they don't even list the cameos, but you know, like, there are so many recognizable celebrities that are in this. And it's, like, it's very interesting, because there is, like, another 90s Robin, Robert Altman movie that was an Oscar-nominated movie. And for uh, The Player, it was nominated for Adapted Screenplay, 
um, he, and, um, um, uh, editing and directing for Robert Oldman, which he lost, um, I know for directing he lost to Clint Eastwood for, um, Unforgiven, uh, but the film did not get in the picture lineup, because back then it was still five, and, um, there was also shortcuts, um, that he made the following year, which, honestly, I don't get shortcuts, I don't, like, yeah, there are so many plot points that we're going in, and there is based on a lot of several short stories connected to the same universe, like the Three Colors trilogy, but honestly, it just, like, it was way too long, there were a lot of complications, like, yes, it does have a big name cast, like, not just Andy McDowell, who was also in that, but you also had, um, Lily Tomlin, I know there was, uh, Robert Downey Jr., yeah, pretty young, hung in the time before he was Iron Man, he was in a Robert Altman movie, and, like, uh, um, Jack Lemmon is also in there in a small part, and it just, honestly, I think, yeah, this is the Altman movie that I didn't enjoy it over shortcuts. Um, definitely very interesting of how, um, and yeah, yeah, because it's, yeah, Hollywood Film Studio, like, I'm reading the Wikipedia page of a, an executive producer, uh, like, specifically an Aspen screenwriter that believes he's sending in death threats, and that's why uh, Tim Robbins had killed the screenwriter, even though there was something else peculiar that was going on, um, but, uh, with this massive investigation, but definitely, I, it's very interesting it didn't get in the picture lineup, but... Um, I can't really say because I haven't watched those five films in the picture lineup because, like I said, not a perfect timing to get regular blu rays in stores, I've said before, but the player. So, yeah, it's just an interesting title, but I don't know about the film for Truscan Screen because I can see some people think it might be a little bit off um, of what it's supposed to be, but... Yeah, but that's what the story is kind of about, so. Alright, so, here's a director that I have not um, spoken about in the last two episodes, because I had looked at, had two of his previous films, and we are back with Wes Anderson. Yes, that is right, and of course, I am talking about Spy Number 157 from 2001, The Royal Tenenbaums. I don't know if this is loose or not, but, uh, very curious, but, um, so yeah, this is, of course, um, Anderson's, um, first Oscar-nominated movie, as this was nominated for original screenplay for Anderson and Owen Wilson, which I think it's still his only Oscar nomination, like, he has never been nominated for acting thing, and this is, yeah, I think this is his only Oscar nomination, just as a writer, um, the film, of course, has um, another big n n notable cast. You have, um, you have, of course, Gene Hackman. You have Angelica Houston. You have Danny Glover. You have uh, Ben Stiller. I I was surprised he was in this film. I did not know he was going to be in this. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, um, Luke, Luke Wilson, um, of course, Bill Murray, Owen Wilson. Um, like, those are probably the big name ones. And, yeah, I I was very surprised uh, to see Ben Silver in a, movie, in a Wes Anderson movie. I was not expecting that. Um, and this is... The, yep, this was, of course, loose as I knew it. Uh, and this is actually a pretty fun movie as well. Definitely another great um, Anderson movie. Um, oh, boy, here we go again. Uh, I know when it comes to Wes Anderson movies, you're going to get a bunch of this. Um, what is... It? Oh, and yes... You do get the po a poster. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Oh boy, is this like supposed to be like details of the houses or the houses or something? Like this is supposed to. Be oh, this is supposed to be like the entire. Um, like I think this is like a map of the, um, the house itself, the Tenenbaum House, um, one 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 Archer Avenue. Um, and yep, this is the uh, booklet. I believe it's like yep, it's like the previous two with um, Pants Labyrinth and the player, where it's oh, um, very unique with the art style. Like it, that's one of the things when it comes to Wes Anderson um, Criterion Blue Race because you're not gonna know what you're gonna get because you're gonna get almost like a lot of this. Um, yeah. Um, other types of awards that it got, like I know Gene Hackman won a Globe for comedy or musical. Um, 
yeah, it's very interesting he did it again in the Oscars. Um, but, yeah, this movie was pretty small. Um, but it did end up... Like, some people still consider this um, his best one. Um, I do think I would definitely... I do enjoy this next to Moonrise Kingdom. But Brian Budapest will tell still the best one I've seen um, from him. But, um, really like the... It, because it, this is a... Um, um, Luke Wilson's character, but um, the kid actor who's playing his character with um, the blue, I forgot what was the, the uh, what was the eagle's name? I I completely forgot about it. I, uh, I oh man, I should have known it. But oh Mordecai, oh I I'm an idiot. It it's it's in the front of the the case. It says go Mordecai. So um, yeah, Richie is um, Luke Wilson's character as the young Richie is letting Mordecai go. Um, it's in the beginning of the movie, and very interesting music they had at the beginning. Uh, oh man, I, oh yeah, they had Hey Jude, uh, in there, and, um, yeah, th like, that's a, uh, the song that is in during the opening of the movie, and I, there's even, believe it or not, uh, Peanuts mu music, you know, um, from A Charlie Brown Christmas, and, like, they have the opening music from that, um, that you usually hear, not the Linus and Lucy one, but, like, you know, when they're, um, like the dun 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 That's what they. I'm most surprised Peanuts music was actually in this film. I I'm guessing Wes Anderson was a big Peanuts fan, but I'm not really sure. But I'm very excited to see what it is because when it comes to Wes Anderson, Criterion Blu-rays, you get a lot of supplements. And finally, for this episode. Um, we have a n movie that comes from the new millennium, a.k.a. 2000. And this is Spy number 151, so it's kind of close to the spy number for the Royal Tenenbaums. Um, directed by Steven Soderbergh, Traffic. Um, yeah, um, this is, of course, a movie, unlike Shortcuts, that has so many plot elements that the characters are in the same universe. This one actually does work. And, um, many people do consider this his best film. Um, it has, like, a big all-star cast. Uh-oh. Yep. <laughs> I think, uh, maybe the traveling of my Blu-rays probably might have let, uh, made my, um, Blu-ray cases a bit loose. Luckily, there's no damage, so. Pat's Labyrinth had a little tear in its booklet, and all three of the Blu-ray discs were all loose. Uh... Man, it looks like for this particular... This is it? I'm a little bit surprised that it's a short um, uh, essay that you get into that. Uh, but it does have, of course, a big, massive cast. It is based on I believe, the British miniseries that it is. And there is, like, so many plot points, but all the characters are in the same universe, and it actually does work. You have Benicio Del Toro. Uh, you have Michael Douglas. You have... Uh, oh, Topher Grace is in this movie? Uh, Albert Finney. You have Catherine Zeta-Jones. Uh, yeah, the Douglas and Zeta-Jones connection. Don Cheadle. Um, Louise, um, is he? Yeah, Louise Guzman, he, because he plays, um, Cheadle's partner. Uh, Benjamin Brad is in this. Oh, Viola Davis? I didn't, I didn't see her, but, um, like, like, Amy Irving, Erica Costini, like, the thing is, all these plot elements do have to deal with the subject of a big drug war between the United States and Mexico. And, um, there is a, some Spanish in this, since we do in the Mexico Pavilion with the Torres character. And, um, I do think I love Del Torres' performance. And, the, like, the performances are really great, especially Benicio Del Toro. Uh, because of the Oscars, it won... Almost everything it was nominated for. It won for film editing. It won supporting actor for Benicio Del Toro. Won adapted screenplay for Steven Gagan. And directing for Steven Soderbergh, which he lost himself uh, since he was also nominated for Aaron Brockovich that same year. Except for Best Picture. Traffic won everything except for the main one as it went to Ridley Scott's Gladiator. A Ridley Scott movie has a Best Picture winning title, yet Scott himself has still hasn't a commit an Oscar of his own. But, yeah, it's very interesting that he still doesn't, but a movie directed by him has a Best Picture winning title. And some people are gonna 
not going to agree with Gladiator winning that because Traffic looked like an easy winning there, but it didn't do well. Like, um, like it did really well, like their screenplay in Del Toro, and very interesting at SAG, it did win the ensemble, but Del Toro won for actor in a leading role. But it's very interesting because they obviously the rest of them put him supporting because when you watch Traffic, um, it's more of an ensemble movie, and there's basically no lead. And that's why it makes sense why Del Toro would go supporting in the Oscars. But Sack put him in leading for some reason. Um, like, if he wasn't there, because obviously it was him first, because Russell Crowe was sweeping that for Gladiator, um, if I'm correct, but I can't really know because I don't have the research in front of me. I'm just looking at what the accolades traffic got. So, like... Yeah, those are, like, the main ones, because it just, like, it's just supporting actor for Del Toro and adapted screenplay. It won the ensemble cast, Del Toro won for leading at SAG, and it won almost everything but Best Picture. Would I agree with that? I can't really say, because obviously I haven't seen Chocolat, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Aaron Brockovich, or even Gladiator yet. Um... Especially if I would say that this is better than uh, Gladiator, I can't really say. And that basically kind of wraps it up. I know this might be a little bit short, uh, but um, as of this recording, I kind of have some things to do um, um, later today. But, new conditions to this. So, with Del Toro, Altman, Anderson, and Soderbergh, um, if you do like this video you can hit that um, like button hit the subscribe button um comment down below if you have seen any of four of these movies and make sure you stay tuned for either next week or the following week um that um, my channel update will be coming of regarding some things including questioning about season three of macy's parade balloons will it happen or will it not I will discuss that in the update. So, with that being said, um, I thank you for watching also for these um, past retrospective of these five Criterion Oscar Blu-rays. I might take a break um, from doing this because we'll have to see how the up when you'll find out when it's going to go in the update. But with that being said, thank you for watching and hope you have a good weekend.